Hi, everyone, and good morning. We're back again with another episode of the Let's Talk Real. Uh, hi, Kelly, how are you doing? Great, how are you? Very good, too. Looks like we you got some snow this morning, right? Yes, <laughs> we did. So my kids are like, is, is school delayed? Well, Sophia was like, is school delayed? I'm like, no, your brother's already at school. <laughs> She's like, can I stay home? <laughs> <laughs> right. No, that's that's funny. <laughs> Kids always want to use the, the the first opportunity they have to. Hey, that's yeah. not. Let's keep school. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. So today we're gonna be talking about um, conventional ops. So we're gonna be explaining exactly what they are. You know, what are their requirements? What are the characteristics of the conventional ops? And um, we're probably gonna be starting with the myth of the day. Um, and explain to you guys something that a lot of people think about, which is uh, that you need 20% down payment when you're using a conventional loan. Um, when we first talk conventional, right, Kelly, everybody thinks you need 20% down, and that's not necessarily true, and we're going to break it down. But um, yeah, so we're going to be talking about the different types, so you won't need, you need to know that you do not need 20%. That is definitely the biggest thing. So let's get started. Kelly's going to give us some insights on the characteristics of the conventional loan. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, conventional loans are one of the most popular loans that people use to purchase the home. Um, and it, hold on a second. So there are several there, conventional loans, are what we call our Fannie Freddie conventional. And uh, Nini said the biggest myth of the day is 20% um, down requirement. And that is not the case. And we actually have a first time home buyer where you only have to put 3% down. And again, we spoke about first time home buyers in one of our other episodes. And one of the characteristics of that is you, if you haven't owned a home within the last three years, you're considered a first time home buyer. So if that is the case, you only have to put 3% down. Um, now you do need your closing costs. Don't forget about that. Well, let's not forget that part. <laughs> um, so yeah, so with conventional loans, you only have to put 3% down. If you only put, if you don't put 20% down, then you are, you will be required to pay private mortgage insurance, which we'll get into a little later in this episode. Um, but that is a necessity when not putting 20% down. If you put 20% down, then you don't have to pay that. That's a little less that your monthly mortgage payment is going to be. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so conventional loans are, like I said, the, they are the most common and it's our Fannie Freddie, um, carrier that does the conventional loans and you know it's it's your basic mortgage where you put a percentage down and that's what you use to purchase a home most realtors in this market that we're in they're going to look for a conventional approval over an fha and ba yeah um, that is and there's the a reason for that maybe we can bring that up too so in a conventional loan um, when you are in a competing situation, I think we even probably brought that up in, in different episodes, but when you have a conventional loan, it's perceived to be a stronger offer, mainly because the requirements behind home conditions are a little less strict than, let's say, an FHA or VA loan. Um, and that's why it is perceived a better loan. Uh, it is also mostly common used for like investors that are, if they are financing, they will be using a conventional loan um, because it is again, not as, as a strict. So when it goes through the appraisal process, there's probably going to be less requirements coming from that appraiser in comparison to it, FHA or VA appraiser. So I think that's probably why, what do you mean there with the, you know, yes. the stronger offer? Correct. Because you look like a stronger borrower versus because conventional is a little, is more, um, they're more strict on the requirements for you as a borrower, where they're not necessarily as strict on the property. Yeah. Uh, so that just kind of goes into the next piece with the eligibility. So the minimum FICO is 620, and that's actually across the board on all of the products at Sierra. Mm -hmm. uh, there is no minimum income requirement 
unless you're doing the 3% down first time home buyer. It's um, we have two products, it's Home Ready and Home Possible. And that income limit depends on you the borrower, where you're purchasing the property and the property itself. So we actually don't know what that minimum requirement is until we run our automated underwriting system, which we can do, we, we would know within a half an hour of getting your application and getting in the system. So with those first time home buyer, there is a minimum, but other than that, there is no minimum down payment. And like I said, mentioned earlier, the, um, the lowest down payment that you can put down on the property is 3%. Um, and pretty much, you know, as far as income and everything, we're going to pull everything like we normally do. We want to see two year history of, uh, employment and, um, and income. So it has to be consistent as well as we need to see assets. We want to verify that you have enough money to put down regardless of it being 3% or 20%. Yeah. And that's pretty much it. For the most part it, on eligibility do you have anything to add to the eligibility on your side just from looking at it from a realtor standpoint no necessarily no um it really comes down whether they can approve the conventional on my end right so once they are eligible to purchase that with that conventional loan, um there is one thing that is crucial in my perspective um is the type of homes that they can go for as well because a lot of times if a person has an fha or va they might be more limited as for what properties i can show it to them mm -hmm. uh, for example condos is a big one uh, a lot of condos are not going to go fha they have to have some sort of certification of approval in order to be able to be purchased through an fha loan while with conventional that's a little less strict um there's Still, there's some limitations with our condos when it comes to like a percentage of renters and having being approved by the Freddie Mae. Freddie Mae. Uh, but overall, you have way more uh, property options, let's put it that way, when you have a conventional loan in comparison to a FHA loan. And we can look up the condos. So yeah. make sure whether it's an FHA or conventional to make sure it's an approved condo. So we, there is a website that we can go on and look that up. So if you're going to look at a property, I can look that up to make sure that you're good to go to show it. Um, yeah. So yeah, so with conventional, a lot of your realtors are gonna to wanna to see conventional over the other types because conventional means that they have a good borrower. Um, conventional is more strict on you as a borrower, whereas the others aren't quite, the government loans aren't quite as strict on you as a borrower. Uh, okay. That kind of falls on top in our pros and cons of the conventional loan there. So we already brought it up that it is perceived to be a stronger offer. So that would be a pro there because yep. um, it is more, like you said, more strict on the buyer approval side. So there's a lot more guidelines. So when, when a seller, you know, seller's agent receive a, a conventional offer, they know that that buyer most likely at a more through approval process or, and they're a stronger buyer overall. Not that a FHA buyer wouldn't be, it's just that there's different guidelines. And um, also when it comes to the inspection and appraisal process, uh, conventional loans are more flexible, not as strict. So the sellers are looking for that because they know it would be maybe a smoother um, transaction process for, for the sale. Um, so that's one of the pros on my side. Maybe you can give some, uh, some pros and cons on your end. Yep. So, so you got it. So um, they're not strict on the property. That is definitely a pro. So if you have an investor and they're looking to flip and they, you know, there's a property that may not be in the most, may not be in mint condition, um, if you go conventional, most likely the appraiser is not going to flag anything. Um, there's the MI, the mortgage insurance on a conventional is, isn't quite as high and you only have one mortgage insurance. Whereas with FHA, for example, you have mortgage insurance, but you also have your um, mortgage insurance premium that you pay over the life of the loan. So with conventional, you don't have that. Um, the other piece with conventional, and I have not received any of these, but most of my FHA loans aren't putting 20% down. But if you, in some cases, if you put 20% down, 
you could possibly get an appraisal waiver, which is very huge in the competing market. Um, yeah. I don't know the algorithm as to what. That was a surprise, right? Because sometimes you're like, for sure, this house is going to receive an, a waiver and it doesn't. Correct. And then sometimes it's the other way around too. So, Correct. So I've had older houses, like older houses, not actually get the appraisal waiver and newer houses not get it when the, when the borrower was putting 20% down. Mm -hmm. But like the ones that we have received that uh, appraisal waiver, that was huge in this market because that's one less thing that has to be done. We could get the loan closed in two to three weeks and it's done. Yeah. Um, and we did mention that on our episode about how to make your offer more competitive. Yes. And that is that is a huge tool uh, when trying to compete because if there's no appraisal, that's one last contingency that seller has to kind of worry about. So if a buyer comes in with an offer that has no appraisal contingency, no inspections, it's basically like a cash offer. They're guaranteed to close. There's nothing that can be stumbled in between other than maybe the financing itself. For some reason, some drastic, some, something drastically happened to the buyer and they, they can no longer qualify for the financing. That would be the only last contingency uh, that that seller would have to worry about. Uh, but otherwise, it makes it super strong of an offer. Yep. So that kind of goes over the most of the pros for conventional. The cons, there's not many. Um, like we mentioned earlier, they're a little bit more strict on credit. So I'll just use an example. If you had maybe a chapter seven and it's dropped off, um, it's been more than the seven years and it's dropped off and you have somebody else who never had a chapter seven, most likely that other person of the chapter seven, we may or may not get an approval, whereas the, and your interest rate will probably be a little higher. You may have to pay a little more just yeah. because of the credit history versus somebody who had a little bit better credit. Um, and the other piece that you might have to pay a little bit higher on is the mortgage insurance premium. So I always tell people the better the credit, the less you'll pay in mortgage insurance. Yeah. Um, Again, I don't know the algorithm. I just know that if your credit isn't up to par, and but you're still able to go conventional, we can still get an approval conventional, that mortgage insurance is going to be a little higher than somebody else who has a little bit better credit. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's more liability on the bank's end. It is. You lend money to a person. It's a, it's a more risk to us. And um, again, that's just part of mortgage insurance. So those are those are mainly the bigger cons with conventional. There's not many. Um, they're just tough on you. There's uh, a chance that if the interest rate could be potentially higher, also because yep. of credit, correct? It could. It could, yeah. but it, it could, but it couldn't. It depends. Again, if you're a credit still up to par, but you're putting, you know, twenty percent down, you may get the same interest rate as somebody who's only putting five or ten percent down, and you know, so. But yes, it could possibly affect your credit score as well. Not having up to par credit, um, I have seen it differ, not by a whole lot, but you may get a little bit worse, a little bit less, a little bit higher interest rate. <laughs> I was yeah, going to say lower interest rate, a little bit higher interest rate with. Yeah. Um, and we mentioned, and you mentioned that okay, twenty percent is not required. But what are the other options? You said that first time home buyers can be two percent, but there's different variations in the right? Um, so yes, um, so I was going to go into the private mortgage insurance next with which kind of, I wanted to talk about the 3% down. Okay. So, yeah. So let's get into that. And then we mentioned, um, so, so yes, so with the different variations with conventional and putting the money down, so we have our home possible, home ready, 3% down. Now the mortgage insurance for those two particular products is going to be higher. So I, and that's, I mean, if your credit score is good, you're still going to pay a little bit higher, um, higher well, rate in the mortgage insurance, yeah. just because it's higher risk to us. You're only putting 3% down. Um, obviously the more you put down, the less mortgage insurance you pay, but it's, it's still there. Um, and again, private mortgage insurance is something that is paid to help secure the lender. 
if you, the borrower, were to go in default, that protects us. So um, that's why there's that 20% mark. If you're putting 20% down, you don't have to pay it because you're a strong borrower. We know that you have the money, you put the money down, um, and you paid your closing costs versus somebody who's only putting 3% down. That's why your mortgage insurance is much higher on a 3% down versus yes. a 5, 10, or 15% down. Um, but do you have anything to add to that? that on the PMI? Yeah. No, I just actually thought of one additional possible con on convention that I didn't think about before. Okay. Uh, so just not to kind of jump around, but to just remind some people. So when it comes to negotiating seller's assistance, oh, if you are okay. using a conventional loan and you're putting less than 10% down as a down payment, um, you limit yourself with the ability to negotiate sales assistance of up to 3%. In Pennsylvania, yes. we are allowed to negotiate up to 6 overall, but when you're using a conventional loan and you're putting less than 10% down, then your max allowed for seller's assistance is 3%. Um, which is not necessarily a con con, but I guess that's a limitation. So it is sort of a con. Um, so we are maxed at 3%, but once you put more than 10%, then you can actually get up to, to 6%. Is that correct? Yes, that is, yeah. that is correct. And, um, you know, sometimes the other piece, which would be kind of like a, maybe a pro and a con, but you can kind of work that seller assist with how much. So say you have somebody who's not putting as much down and they need to, maybe they need seller assist, uh -huh. um, but they're a strong borrower. Um, now I'm kind of losing what I'm saying here. Were you talking to talk about the buy down or? Well, well, yeah, you could, Put that into the buy down option that we went over um, that would be that so yes if you added the buy down in with that particular um scenario that that's that's more of a a, a competitive offer for the seller that you know even though they're putting that percentage down maybe they want to do the buy down with the lower interest rate and get sellers yeah. If they're putting a little bit more down and they want that lower interest rate, they could get up to 6% if they put more than 10% down. Um, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. So if they get that makes so sense. more money down and then not add. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the seller assist could be put towards the buy down for the borrower to get that lower interest rate, you know, given it's a good borrower. I mean, obviously, if they're looking to put more than 10% down, then you're more than likely going to have a, a little bit, you're in a little bit better um, buying position if you're putting more down. Yeah. So, so yeah. But it's a good point. It's a good point. So back, to, yes, back to the seller assist. Um, you are absolutely right. If you put more than 10% down, you um, can get up to 6% and then anything less than that is 3%. So I don't know if you consider that a con or not with, yeah, I mean, it is sort of a limitation, so I would say maybe a con on conventional, but I, you're still able to get assistance. Um, it's just that you would need more down. In order to yeah. and, and it's, I mean, to be honest, the slave market is very tough to get a six person on as assistance. Yes. <laughs> um, but if you get three, that's already amazing. Um, so in a conventional arm, it's actually not bad that you're still able to get three out of three. Um, and sometimes we actually negotiate flat amounts just to kind of help that client you know, do the, the max or the, you know, cash out of pocket that they have. So we try to work it out uh, in a way that is not as asking too much of the seller, but at the same time still helping the buyer just as much as they need in order to make that deal happen. So. so, and the only other thing I want to say about PMI is. Mm -hmm. If, if you are not putting 20% down, your private mortgage insurance will drop off when your balance is at 78% loan to value. Yes, if you that would be know, an automatic drop off, right? That's automatic. So if, but if you know what the 80% number is, um, which I can give anybody when they, because it would be 80% of the appraised value or the purchase price, which 
the lower of the two when you purchase a home. I can give you what that number is. When your balance gets to that 80%, you can call and have it removed. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't do that, then it does get removed at 78%, but you can call um, once the balance gets to 80% and have them remove it at that time. Yeah. So, or, so to make, what? or you can have another appraisal done on your property. I was going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. And most people, <laughs> once you get to that point, they, they don't, but again, you know, everybody's situation is different. So yeah. Yeah. And everybody you know. has a different take on it. Um, so my 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 thing on that so just to give maybe even further insight to it for them to understand so if we think of a purchase price of a hundred thousand dollars to make it super simple right you bought the house at 100 and you were approved for a conventional loan where you first time home buyer so only three percent down that means you're finding the amount even though you bought it at 100 you put three percent down so you put three thousand down and then your finance amount is 97. So you know that that PMI is gonna drop off automatically when you hit 78%, which would be when you pay down from 97 to 78,000. So that's basically what we mean with the percentages there. Um, the reason why it's so important for you to stay in touch with your realtor is that if the market, like for the last two years, a lot of people took advantage of that because if the market is going up very quickly, uh, your expectation of getting to that 80% might be maybe five years, but depending how quickly the, the market is going up, you might reach that 80% much sooner. And it might make sense to get an appraisal to drop off the PMI, PMI much sooner as well. Um, and also it's thinking that you can because again, interest rates could be dropping. It could make sense financially to uh, refinance at that point as well. And then you might be able to refinance and, and remove the PMI at that point if you have enough equity. Uh, so there's different ways to go about it, uh, but staying in touch with your realtor and your loan officers is really key uh, after you purchase as well. So don't think like you only need us before because afterwards it's actually pretty important too. That way we can you know, keep an eye for those numbers for you and potentially save you money on the long run of your loan as well. Yes, because more than likely, if you were to refinance, we would have a new appraisal done and more than likely your home has increased in value. Um, you know, most homes do. Uh, some homes appraise higher than others, but the average home does increase in value over time. So um, that, and again, it's it definitely makes sense to keep in touch with both of us just to see like with Nini, where's the market at? Like what, where are the home values at mm -hmm. um, versus, and then me to see, it doesn't make sense to refinance because I can run the numbers and I, if it doesn't make sense, then I would say, don't do it. But if it does, then yeah, do it. Cause I can yeah. do scenarios where it shows you how much you can save over the life of the loan if you were to refinance. And sometimes you save, sometimes you don't. If you don't save, then obviously you don't refine things. But if you are saving, then it definitely makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably the biggest takeaway of the day. <laughs> Stay in touch with us. Yes. <laughs> to make sure Absolutely. we can help you in the long run. But uh, maybe we can do a little quick summary then of the convention. So we mentioned about the big myth of conventional loans having to have a 20% down payment, that's not true. Uh, there's many different types of conventional loans out there. Uh, the first one was the uh, first time home buyer with 3% down. And would you just say the name of the program once now? Um, there's two, Home Possible and Home Ready. One's Fanny and one's Freddie. <laughs> that, that rhyme. <laughs> Fanny and Freddie. Yeah, so that's that's like the biggest part there. And then um, some characteristics, char char oh. Characteristics. You see, that's the Brazilian in me. <laughs> I cannot say the words. Um, but uh, it, can, it can be um, that you could potentially uh, have a stronger offer with the conventional loan because it's perceived to be a better type of loan because it has less restrictions when it comes to property condition and property type. Um, it allows you as the buyer to look at a bigger pool of houses when in comparison to you know, other government backed loans. Um, and then the eligibility requirements, you can summarize that for us. Yes, so eligibility, um, minimum credit score is 620. Um, 
There is a minimum re- there is a minimum income requirement for the home ready and the home possible, the two three percent first time home buyer. But other than that, other than those two products, there is no minimum income requirement for conventional. And um, you know your down payment. There, the minimum is three percent. You don't have to put twenty percent down for um, for conventional. And we want to see a two-year history of income and um, and employment. So we want to see that it's consistent within the last two years. Um, and and we would want to, as far as your assets, we would just look at your most recent months. Um, of what's in there in the bank. So yeah. we just want one month. We don't need to see two year history of your bank statements. Just one month is usually what we look, look for. And yeah. that's pretty much. And the higher your credit, the lower, the lower your PMI is. Yep, the higher your credit, the lower your PMI is and the lower your, your interest rate as well yes. in certain situations. Um, but yes. But if you're preparing to purchase, that would be the biggest thing you can do on your own is work on your credit yep. because it, it brings you so many advantages. So if you don't, if you don't remember anything we talked about today, remember that just work on your credit <laughs> and yep. then reach out to Kelly when you are in a good position. And, and credit, also, the biggest thing with credit also. is with the biggest thing with keeping a good credit score, or increasing your credit score is using your credit, mm-hmm. but paying it on time. So if you have, and if you have credit cards that have um, annual fees, you want to pay those off and close them out because there's no reason why anybody should be have uh, an annual fee on their credit card. So using your credit, making your payments on time and getting rid of any credit cards with annual fees. Those are some some important tips to keep in mind, uh, especially with the spring market coming up and just taking a look at your your uh, your overall uh, scenario with what you have with your credit and that'll only help you. And make sure if you have multiple credit cards that you actually do use all of them. Just like even if you put 10 bucks into it and pay it off, uh, that is actually great. Um, but I always make sure you never use more or you pass it over to the next month more than 30% of what you have as credit. So always under 30, right, Kelly? I think that's yes, 30% is the, is the number if you're looking to pay them down. Because sometimes when you pay things off, it could possibly hurt your score. No. But if you're looking to pay things down, if you pay it down to the 30% mark, that's a, a good number to stand by. And then just keep revolving with that use of those credit cards. Even if you don't use it, just make sure you like put guess one time in there. Just so you have something and then pay it off. Uh, yep. because they keep an eye on your usage as well. Uh, and it might potentially help you boost up the credit limits for those cards too. And then if that happens, your cra- credit becomes higher than your debt. So the debt to income ratio, uh, it's huge as well when you're going for approval uh, with a mortgage. So uh, keep that in mind. If you're doing, if you're not doing that right now, start doing that now. Uh, oh yes, we didn't talk about the debt to income ratio. We did. Yeah. 28 and 32 is are the, the key numbers, but we can go up to as high as is that 42. Well, yes, 42 on conventional. Sometimes you can go a little higher with the first time home buyer, but 28 and 32 are the numbers you want to try and stay Sweet. at. <laughs> <laughs> And it's hard for a person to know what if they are on those percentages, right? So um, that's why it's so important to at least talk to them. If you're not ready to get approved now, but you want to have an idea of where you are, uh, at least you can have a conversation with her and understand that. That way, you guys can work together and and you know get to the point you need to be. Um, a lot of people they decide I want to buy a house now, but we yeah. don't do preparation. If you are even thinking, a lot of people tell me, I'm just looking. Well, that's the time to start looking into your credit, too, and start talking to the loan officer. Because when you are ready to buy, you need to be ready. And a lot of people want to get ready and do everything at one time. And that's not necessarily how it should go. Right. So this kind of work happens months before. It happens on the things of just looking (laughs) that people always tell me. So... When you're just looking, you start looking into your finances, talk to the loan yep. officer, 
to know and understand where you need to get in order to be the best and most qualified. Um, so you can get the better terms of your loan, the better interest rates, the better PMI. Um, and a lot of people just don't think about that because they don't know, right? They don't know any better. And that's why we're here. Yep. And I want to quick say, so people understand what 28 and 32 is. Oh, yes. So you want it. So 28 is all of your current debt versus your monthly income. Yeah. And then the 32% is all your current debt plus the new mortgage versus your income. Just so people understand what, what 28 means and what 32 means. So that's, that's what those two numbers are. I mean, you said we can stretch it out to the 42, sometimes even a little past that for first time home buyers. Yes, yeah. yes, you can. It, so, there, there is some wiggle room in there for people, but 28, 32 are the numbers to stand by. <laughs> there it goes. Well, do you have anything else to add for us for this episode today? Kelly? I don't. I think that's, I think that pretty much covers our conventional loans. Okay. I don't think I got any questions today from uh, our live watchers. So if you're watching this after we went live, make sure you can DM us on, you know, whatever platform you're watching this from. There was a message or call us in the number below. We'd we'll be happy to do further, you know, explain anything that we talked about today or in previous episodes. Alrighty. Okay, Kelly, thank you so much for, for joining me today again. Yeah. Um, and thank you all that was watching and is still watching because soon have some people live. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you guys next week on our Let's Talk Real. <laughs> all right. Good one. See you later. Yeah.